Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, amma ba'd. Um, first, I, I, I would like to apologize because um, today uh, I initially planned to uh, cover the the basmala in some detail and then move on to the uh, surah however due to some difficult circumstances um, I wasn't really able to to prepare for that so inshallah today lesson might be slightly brief but we will go through the remaining um, aspects of the basmala um, so last week we looked at the initial part of the the phrase the Bismi, and now we will discuss in some detail uh, the name Allah, the name Allah. <clears throat> now, when speaking about names, we know that in all languages we have names which are uh, what we call proper nouns, uh, names which... Um, um, essentially are known to be titles given to people and these names do not maybe they don't you know have a, a specific meaning okay by the way did we actually last week speak about the name Allah we didn't did we okay all right so for example in english you know we might have names such as bob okay or john or robert you know these names they don't really have a meaning okay Likewise, even in the Arabic language, you find many proper names don't actually have, you know, real meanings behind them. Like Khadija, for example, or Sufyan. Okay? Now, by the way, just to, uh, for those who are married and are planning to have children, never ever go on websites that tell you the meanings of the names of children. Okay? Or, names, or the meanings of, the, of names. Most of them are, are, are absolutely incorrect okay i don't know where they get these meanings from but they have no basis whatsoever in the arabic language so just be wary of that okay be, be really wary of that if you want to know the meaning of a name you know consult someone who can speak arabic well not these websites most of these websites haven't even been set up by people who can speak arabic so anyhow but then you have names which have meanings okay names which actually have meanings like we know with the name muhammad for example has a meaning it has a meaning. We say uh, it means the one who is praised frequently. Okay, so in Arabic we say names are either, we say mushtaq, which means they're derived, mushtaq, they're derived from certain roots, and usually all words in the Arabic language are derived from three basic letters. Okay, three basic letters. All major words, you can say the majority of words, they're derived from three basic letters. Uh, in the Arabic language. And then you have those which are not mushtaq. Okay, they are non-derived. So the question here is the name Allah. Is the name Allah, is it derived or is it non-derived? Meaning, is it based upon a basic root word and thus it has a meaning? Or is it, the ne is it you know, a name which has no particular meaning, it's just a title or, or given to someone? This is something we find that the scholars do differ over. However, the view that we will, inshallah, say it's you know, closer to the truth, that really the name of Allah is mushtaq. It's a derived noun. It's a derived noun. It comes from a root word. And thus it has a deep meaning to it. An original meaning to it. So what is this original meaning? And where is it derived from? 
So we say the, the word Allah is derived from the word Aliha. Aliha. So you have the Hamza, the Lam, and the Ha. Aliha. Aliha. That's the basic root meaning. Uh, sorry, the root, uh, uh, the, the root letters. What we, in English we call the radicals. Okay, the free radicals. In Arabic we call the jither, the jither, the root of a, of, of a word. Now, what, are, what does aliha mean? What does aliha mean? What does this verb mean? This word actually can have a number of meanings. Okay, and we will try and focus on a few of them. The first meaning of aliha is that it is a word which um, reflects perplexion, when someone is confused, when someone is startled. Okay, at tahayyur we say in Arabic, tahayyur yani usually we say tahayyur it refers to confusion. When someone is confused about something, we say it's hayran or mutahayyur. And so this word aliha is related to that. However, there's a certain aspect of uh, perplexion and confusion that um, is particular to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so great that the human mind cannot fathom, cannot understand the nature of Allah. We cannot understand the nature of Allah. We cannot appreciate the greatness of Allah and His qualities and His perfection. And so if a person wants to stop and try and reflect over Allah and His greatness, he will be startled, he will be perplexed. It will be too much for his mind to even try and comprehend. It's too much. So this is not a perplexion and confusion which is based on doubt. You know, sometimes people are confused because they're in doubt, isn't it? Okay, if someone says, I'm confused about Islam, what does that mean? It usually means that he's in doubt about Islam, isn't it? No, this is not the type of confusion that we're, we're speaking about here. You know, sometimes you might see something which is so amazing. Okay, if you see a small child, for example, you know, a two-year-old doing algebra, he'll be amazed, isn't it? You'll be startled. You, you don't understand. How, how can this be? I, I, you, you won't believe it's possible. You'll be startled. That's the type of perplexion that is related to the name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the idea is Allah, Allah is the one who, and He's so great and beyond our comprehension, that if you were to even try and think about Allah, it's too much for us. That's why it's a very interesting hadith, which is reported in Bayhaqi and other books of hadith. Tafakkaru fi ala illa wa la tufakkiru fi Allah. Okay? Tafakkaru fi ala illa, which means reflect over the bounties of Allah. Reflect, reflect over the bounties of Allah. But don't reflect over Allah Himself. Meaning, don't try and understand how does Allah look. Okay? This is something which we cannot do. In fact, it's wrong for us to do. Why? Because if I told you, you know, try and imagine what Allah looks like, what are you going to think of? You're going to think about everything that you have already perceived in this worldly life. Because the human mind can only envision that which it has seen from creation. And the human mind has only experienced creation. That's why we shouldn't try and reflect over the essence of Allah. It's beyond us. Okay? And this is why you'll find people fell into shirk. People fell into you know, anthropomorphism where they likened Allah to His creation. What we see, for example, amongst Christianity, where, where, they, tr where they try and imagine God. What does God look like? An old man with white hair and a beard. Okay, yani, this is, and this is a result of them not understanding the greatness of Allah. If they truly understood the greatness of Allah, then they would never have fell into this problem. But as soon as you think God is like creation, that the, opens the door to all evil. And that's why Christians don't have a problem with saying, you know, God can have a son. It's a normal thing. You know, why not? If God is capable of doing everything, why can't he have a son? Why can't he sacrifice himself? Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when they say that Allah has a son, 
It's as if the heavens and the earth are about to split asunder. Because it's too much. You know, the, the, the heavens and the earth, they are about to split due to you know, what they say about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Allah is the one who um, uh, is beyond our, comp- our, our comprehension. The other meaning that uh, Aliha has, so we have one meaning of Aliha, which is that of um, perplexion, being startled. I know, as, as I said, not due to confusion, but really due to the greatness of Allah. Al-ilah means al-ma'bud. Al-ma'bud. Okay, meaning the one who is worshipped. Allah means the one who is worshipped. And if you go for that meaning, then really Allah actually means Al-ilah. Al-ilah. So we have Al-ilah, which means the, the one who is worshipped. But then what you do, you take the Hamza away. The Hamza to the So you have Al and then La. It becomes Allah. Okay, otherwise, it was originally Al-ilah. So we got rid of the Hamza for what, what we say for the sake of Tasheel. And to make it easier upon the tongue to pronounce. Allah is very easy upon the tongue to pronounce as opposed to Al-ilah. Al-ilah. Okay, like you said. Yes. <laughs> Ali has the verb. Ali has the verb. It's the root. And ila we say is a derivative. Okay, it's a derivative. It's a noun that is derived from from the word aliha. Okay. The third meaning which aliha could, could possibly mean is to yearn or to desire. To yearn, to desire. That's why they say, Allah huwa alladhi tahinnu ilayhi al-qulub. Allah is the one who the hearts yearn for. Allah is the one who the hearts yearn for. They desire for. And why is this the case? Because Allah created the fitra, the natural disposition of man to recognize to, to, to recognize the existence of this creator. And so because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created our soul with this internal recognition, naturally we will have a yearning for it. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the soul with many inclinations. Many inclinations. So for example, Allah has created the human being with the inclination to eat and drink. The inclination to fulfill their sexual desires. This is an inclination that Allah has given to every human being. It's a part of our fitrah. Okay, if you ever come across a person who doesn't like eating and drinking and fulfilling their desires, you know, there's something strange about that person. Okay, unless there, there could be some other anomalies, but generally that's going against fitrah. It's going against fitrah. And so Allah has inscribed into our souls, La ilaha illallah. And this is clearly evident. From the, the ayah of Mithaq, the ayah of Mithaq, or the verse of the covenant, what is known as the verse of the covenant, as is in, mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, uh, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 172, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And remember when we took you out from the loins of, you know, the, 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 the loins of the children of Adam, meaning Allah, He brought together all the souls of every single human being, and He said to them, Alastu bi rabbikum. Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? Am I not your Lord? And how did everyone, including ourselves, everyone here reply? Qalu bala. Indeed, you are our Lord. Now, this mithaq, or this covenant we made with Allah, although we cannot remember it ourselves, we cannot remember it, um, but it is something which we have experienced, and therefore, as a result of that, it has been inscribed into our souls. You know, sometimes, for example, you see someone many, many years ago. And after a long time, you see them again. But you can't quite picture who this person is. But you say to yourself, I know this person. I've seen him before from somewhere. Now, what's the state of your mind at that time? You're in a state of agitation. You, you really want to know, you know, you really want to know who this person is. And, and you say to yourself, 
you know, I can't continue unless I know who this person is, where I've met him before. I'm sure you've all experienced something like that. You know, or maybe it's the case that there's a word that you, you knew once and so you suddenly forgot it and you say, hang on a minute, I know that word. What's your state? You're in a state of agitation. To, you're in a state of yearning to know who that person is or what that word is. And this is exactly the same when it comes to Allah. Allah is the one who the hearts yearn for because we have experienced Allah in the sense that Allah has inscribed His name in our soul. This shahada of La ilaha illallah is a part of us. And that's why, see, people have a wrong understanding about fitra, natural disposition. Some people, and this is a very common thing that you find many, especially maybe non-practicing Muslims, they say, they say, well, isn't it unfair that we have some people who are brought up in Muslim families, okay, and you'll find that many of these Muslims, they've been brought up, and you'll find that many of them believe without even being able to convince anyone else of their belief. They're just blind followers. Yeah, like our parents, our parents' generations, are they just blind followers? You know, if, you were to have a, if they were to have a debate with someone, they probably couldn't prove anything about Islam. They don't know anything about the miraculous nature of Islam or the Qur'an. Okay, so, so do we say their faith is deficient? We say no. Their faith is not deficient. Because they've remained upon fitra. They've remained upon fitra. You know, if you go to a man and say, you know, prove to me why you need to eat. And he, he might be someone who's from the forest and, you know, he doesn't know anything about nutrients and why the body needs nutrients and why we need this food to eat to stay alive. He probably just eats because, you know, he's hungry and he sees it, he wants to eat it. Do we say he's deficient because he doesn't know, you know, the reason why he eats, the intricate details? Of course not. So he's upon fitra. And just like, you know, people of maybe our elder generation, they are upon fitra. So we shouldn't look at that their faith is deficient. However, however we say that the, um, without a shadow of a doubt, if a person does know maybe rational arguments, that could possibly strengthen his faith. It could possibly strengthen his faith, but at the same time, it could be, it could work counter to that. I've seen this so much. You know, I've seen this where people have come to the religion and the first thing they are fed or given, okay, they're taught all of these intellectual arguments, the proof of Allah's existence, the proof of that the Qur'an is the word of Allah, the proof, and they're all using essentially Greek philosophical arguments. And these people, you know, they learn it, they become very, very strong, and then a few years later, they leave the fall of Islam. Or they become so confused about these arguments, that they find holes in them. It's happened, I've seen this, I've seen this, really. But you won't find that, for example, with the, with the case of your parents. Can you imagine those who have come from Muslim families from back home and, you know, can you ever imagine them doubting their, their religion? <laughs> you, this is impossible. It's very, very rare. I've never heard of anything like that, really. Well, I've only heard of those who have tried to learn the intellectual argument that end up becoming more confused. Islam is a religion of fitrah. Rasulullah would never debate people using philosophical arguments. You know, very basic premises. Very basic premises. Okay, if Allah doesn't exist, then who created me and you? Okay? Are you the ones who created yourselves? Or did this creation come into existence by itself? So very basic arguments. Yani nothing complex. Because as Allah says, Afillahi shakkun. And is there really any doubt in the existence of Allah? Is there any doubt? And there is no doubt. So... Um, so our hearts naturally have this yearning for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and this is why uh, the, when a believer uh, truly recognizes his need for Allah and he truly recognizes um, that he needs to satisfy this spiritual vacuum that he has by knowing more about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is when he tastes the sweetness of iman. This is why Rasulullah said, Thalathun man kunna fihi wajada halawat al iman. There are three things that if a person has with inside of him, he tastes the sweetness of iman. He tastes the sweetness of iman. And he said, Rasulullah said, and what are these from amongst them? And yakun Allahu wa Rasuluhu ahabba ilayhi min siwa. That Allah and the Messenger are more beloved to him than anything else. 
that Allah and the Messenger is more beloved to him than anything else. As this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, agreed upon. What does hadith mean? This hadith means that if you fulfill and if you fill the spiritual vacuum with inside of yourselves, which is to, because you're, you're, you remember your soul is yearning for Allah, Allah is the one who is yearned for, then you have filled it correctly, the spiritual gap or the vacuum with inside of yourselves, and that is when you taste the sweetness of Iman. Masakir ahli dunya kharaju minha wa madaqu akiba ma fiha. They used to say, the scholars. The, the, the lowly people of this worldly life, they've left it without tasting the sweetest thing in this worldly life. And what is the sweetest thing in this worldly life? Ma'rifatullah. Ma'rifatullah, the knowledge, knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Knowing Allah. If you truly know Allah, then you have reached a level of spirituality that no one else can reach. And this is what, exactly what the kuffar are yearning for today. Exactly what they're yearning for today. You know, if you go to bookshops, you'll find one of the largest sections, mind, body, and spirit. Why do you find so many non-Muslims interested in Buddhism and Sufism? Okay, because they have this gap. They're not fulfilling that gap, which is to know their creator. Whereas if they knew their creator, they would be content. They would be content. So, these are the three essential meanings of... Um, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one further point if we look at the name Allah just look at what the word comprises of Allah okay these letters you'll find you know the Hamza the Lam ha, the Lam and the Ha, ha being from the Halq from, from the Jawf okay Ha and even the elongation. All, all elongations, all mudud, are from uh, the joke. So Allah, it's not Allah, it's Allah. Okay, so these are letters which come, you know, they begin from the throat and from the chest and they return back to the chest. These are not words which are just eman- that emanate just from the tips of our mouth. It comes from inside of us and not only that when we say when you say the name Allah you say it with tafkhim which means you say it with a sense of heaviness you don't say how non-muslims say Allah Allah that's how they say Allah isn't it no you say Allah and there's only a few instances where you don't say it like that as you know in Tashweed like you say Lillahi okay Lillahi you say if you put a lamb before it then it becomes muraqqaq with tarqiq you say it lightly although even some qiraat they say Lillahi Lillahi Okay, um, and this really shows you how this is a name which emanates from deep inside of us. It comes from our inner aspects of our soul, and that's why the name Allah is something is a name which really uh, it's a name which really you know touches the heart, and even you know to a young child, it's soothing to a young child, isn't it? You find many people when they put their children to sleep, what what do they recite? You know, Allahu Allah, La ilaha illallah. And you find that, you know, this is work, it works like a lullaby. And if you even look, subhanAllah, La ilaha illallah, that whole phrase essentially comprises of all the letters you find in Allah. La ilaha illahu. Yeah? La ilaha illahu. La ilaha illallah. These are all letters you find within Allah. It's so easy to say. It's so easy to say. So, this really shows you how the name Allah, really, it is a, uh, a name which, um, uh, which is a part of our uh, natural disposition. Uh, brothers, you know, if you can just leave that door open so that it touches the, uh, the barrier, because sisters usually come and use the bathroom. So. <coughs> okay. And many scholars are of the view that the name Allah is the greatest name of Allah. The greatest name of Allah is Allah. Now this is a dispute amongst the scholars. There are a number of opinions. Imam al-Suyuti, rahimahullah, he wrote a whole book discussing this issue. And why is it important to know what the, what's the greatest name of Allah? Because Rasulullah says, I'm used to, you would say that to Allah belongs a name that if you call upon him, he will respond. And scholars dispute, is it Allah, is it... 
Hayyun ya Hayyun Qayyum, Al Hay and Al Qayyum, Al Rab Al Malik. Any there's differences of opinion, but the strongest view, and maybe this is the view of the majority, that really it is Allah itself. And that's why Allah says, Walillahi al Asma al Husna. To Allah belongs the most beautiful names. To Allah belongs the most beautiful names. And that's why we say, Allah, the Ar Rahman, is the name of Allah. Al Malik is the name of Allah. We don't say, Allah is the name of Ar Rahman, for example. Although some scholars of the view that Rahman is the most, um, is, a, is, a, is the greatest name. Okay. Also, um, what is interesting to know, if we say that Allah, okay, that Allah originally is Al-Ilah, as we said it's a derived noun, Al-Ilah. Now, one of the arguments that people use to say that Allah is not a derived noun is that in the Arabic language, if you call someone out, like you usually use the word ya, yeah, isn't it, to call someone out. And there are many ways you can call someone in Arabic language. One of them is ya, yeah, ya yeah, fulan. Okay? But if the name that you call out begins with alif lam, for example, al Hussein, al Hussein, the name al Hussein, and you say ya, yeah, how do you say, ya yeah, al Hussein? No, you say ya yeah, Hussein. You drop the alif lam. Or someone's name was az Zubair, az Zubair. You say, Ya Zubair, you drop the Alif Lam. So if we say Allah is originally Al Ilah, you would expect the Alif Lam to be dropped when you say, Ya Allah. So some people say, well, this proves you, because the Alif and Lam is not dropped, then this proves that it is a non derived name. But to this we say, no. Due to the greatness and the sanctity of the name of Allah, the Alif Lam cannot be dropped. Due to the sanctity of the name of Allah, you cannot drop this Alif Lam, which means the God, the one who is worthy of being worshipped, the one who the minds are perplexed about, the one who is to be worshipped, and the one who the hearts yearn for. Linked to this point is another way we call out the name Allah. We say, Allahumma. Allahumma. And this is a beautiful way to call out Allah. Why? What is this word comprised of? You have the Allah and then the meme at the end with a shadda. So Allahu, Allahumma. And this means exactly the same, Ya Allah. Why? What's the difference though? What's the difference? The difference is we've changed the order of the phrase Ya Allah. So we want to say, we want to put Allah at the beginning and the ya at the end. So we want, it's as if we want to say, Allahu ya. Now why would someone want to do that? Because a person feels so much, his sense of urgency to call out Allah is so great, he doesn't even want to say ya at the beginning. He just wants to say Allah first, and then he leaves the ya at the end. But the problem is we can't say ya at the end, because the word you say after that, it might sound as if you're calling that person out. That's why we say you substitute the ya for a meme, to indicate that that was originally a ya. So Allahumma is the same as saying Allah, ya Allah, but we, we substitute or we reverse the order, okay? Uh, so that becomes Allahu ya, because you're so much, you, your, your need to call out Allah is so great, you want to say the name of Allah first. It's as if you want to say the name of Allah. And this is similar to what we said last week when we were looking at Bismillah. Why do we say it's a verb that is delayed towards the end? Because you want to begin with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Um, right. So this really concludes our discussion of the name um, Allah. And so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim. People translate in various different ways. Some say the most merciful, the most compassionate. But let us leave these translations aside and try and understand the the root meaning. 
Now, both names, Rahman and Rahim, uh, we agree, all scholars agree that they are derived nouns. They are derived nouns. And they all come from the root word Rahima, Rahima, Rahima. Now, this is a name which has been repeated many times in the Quran. Both of these names, Rahman and Rahim. Rahman has been mentioned 57 times. And Rahim has been mentioned 114 times. Which is the same amount of surahs there are in the Quran. And what is interesting to note, 114 is double of 57. Yeah. And you will appreciate this, this number when you realize the difference in terms of meanings. Okay, between Rahman and Rahim. So let us focus on that. Firstly, mercy. I, I think a beautiful way to express Rahma or mercy is the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu as reported in Abu Dawood. He said, Ana rahman khalaqtu rahim wa shaqaqtu laha isman min ismi. The hadith Qudsi. So Allah, he says, I am ar-Rahman and I created the rahim, rahim. What's the rahim? The womb, the womb of a woman. And I created, so he's the Rahman, and I created the womb, the Rahim. And I derived for it its name from my name. And the name, the womb, Rahim, it's derived from the name of Allah. Why? Because a mother's womb beautifully exemplifies what mercy is all about. The mother's womb exemplifies what mercy is all about. Why? Because the mother's womb is a source of protection. It's a source of, uh, is a place where a person grows and develops and is nurtured in an unmatched way. There's nothing on the face of this planet that can nurture something like the womb of a woman. Nothing. You can create all the any technologies or in terms of life support machines, but there's nothing that can be compassionate and as merciful than the womb of a woman. And this is why it's called the Rahim. I mean, just look when the sperm fertilizes the egg. What human being consciously looks after that embryo and then that fetus? It's no one. Even the mother doesn't consciously get involved in that process. From the way it grows and the way it's protected and where the nutrients are fed to the umbilical cord without any input from any human being whatsoever. And only when the, when the body is ready, to, when the child is ready to come out and that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prepare by his wisdom and by his command um, for the child to come out. So I think this is a really beautiful way of understanding what mercy is all about. There's another type of mercy which, um, which uh, we know, which is, is the type of compassion. We call it in Arabic, Ra'fa. Ra'fa. Ra'fa, and from this name we get the word Ar-Ra'uf. Ar-Ra'uf, the most compassionate. What is the difference between Rahma and Ra'fa? Mercy and compassion. The difference is that with Ra'fa, with compassion... Everyone recognizes the, a person's compassion because it's usually associated with gentleness and kindness. Okay? Whereas Rahma has aspects of Ra'fa, of compassion, whereas sometimes a person is merciful to you, but the person who's receiving that mercy might not recognize it as mercy. A good example of that is what? When a, a, a parent disciplines a child. When a parent disciplines a child, is the parent doing that to punish the child and to torture the child? Or is it really an act of mercy? It's an act of mercy, isn't it? Why? Because the, 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 the parent wants to discipline the child so that they will, you know, be good people and they would be nurtured in a correct way. 
So the Rahmah of Allah, we must realize, it's not just Ra'fa, it's more than that. So people who think, you know, this is a Sharia of difficulty and a Sharia of hardship, praying five times a day, why does Allah burden us with these difficulties? This is due to our jahal, our ignorance. Because this is really an act of Rahmah from Allah. And to some, some people see it beyond being an act of Rahmah, they see an act of Ra'fa, of compassion. Okay, and that is why Rasulullah used to say, وَجُعِلَتْ قُرَّةَ عَيْنِي فِي الصَّلَاةِ The pleasure of my eye has been placed in the prayer. Whereas some people see it as a burden, okay, he would see it as an act of pleasure. He would see it as an act of pleasure. Because the way he perceived that action or that commandment, he didn't see it as an act of rahmah, he saw it as an act of ra'fa, of compassion rather than mercy. But obviously all acts of... Uh, uh, Ra'fa encompass mercy as well. So, and that's why really we cannot truly understand the, the Rahma of Allah. It's beyond our comprehension. It's beyond our comprehension. You know, Rasulullah he said, as reported in uh, Sahih Muslim, indeed Allah has created a hundred portions of mercy. Allah has created a hundred portions of mercy. From those hundred portions of mercy, he sent down one portion of mercy. One portion of mercy which is distributed to all of creation and even amongst the animals. So when you see an animal which is merciful towards its child, that's the result of that one portion of mercy which has been spread across and distributed across humanity and all of the animal kingdom. The 99 remaining parts of mercy, Rasulullah said, Allah reserved that for the believers in the day of judgment. Allah reserved all of that mercy for the believers on the day of judgment. So this is, you know, if you really want to try and picture at least just a small amount of the mercy of Allah, then just you know, look at that hadith and reflect on the mercy that exists between you and your child, between you and your parents. This is nothing in comparison to the mercy that Allah has for you. This is why Rasulullah once he was passing by a woman who was breastfeeding her child and she was near a fire. Rasulullah <coughs> said to uh, the companions, could you ever imagine this woman throwing uh, her child into the fire? Could you ever imagine this woman throwing her, this child into the fire? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah. So he said, Wallahi, Lallahi, that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes to throw his servant into the fire just as this woman dislikes to throw her child into the fire. So the mercy that Allah has for you is always, subhanAllah, any, beyond your comprehension. It's, and it's something you cannot fathom. You know, the other day there was a brother who, whose father was passing away and he was really upset because he said, you know, subhanAllah, how do I know whether my father was a good person? I'm really fearful for my father. I said, ya akhi, you know, know that Allah is more merciful to your father than you are to him. Allah is more merciful to him than you are to him. So why do you worry? Why do you worry? And that's why Rasulullah used to say, لَا يَمُوتَنَّ أَحَدُكُمْ إِلَّا وَهُوَ يُحْسِنُ ظَنَّ بِاللَّهِ None of you should die except you have good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in a hadith that إِنَّ اللَّهَ uh, إِنَّ اللَّهَ uh, كَرِيمٌ حَيِّيٌ the very Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like shy and he's sitir and he's someone who conceals the faults of other people. And he is shy that when his servants raise his hands in supplication, that he returns those hands khaibin. He returns those hands and he, with, with being empty. This is how much mercy Allah has for us that he feels shy not to respond to our uh, supplications. In a beautiful verse uh, that was always on my mind for a long time but I never truly understood why it was said in that way but alhamdulillah I came across a beautiful passage from Ibn Qayyim which explained the verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna rahmatallahi qareebun minal muhsinin inna rahmatallahi qareebun minal muhsinin and those who study Arabic language might find this verse in terms of the grammar of it a bit perplexing 
Inna rahmat Allah. Now, rahma, those of you who know a bit of Arabic, is that a masculine or feminine noun? It's feminine, yeah? Inna rahmata. Tamar at the end. We say, Inna rahmat Allahi qareebun. Qareebun. Now, qareebun, is it masculine or feminine? Masculine. masculine. Now, usually when you explain a noun, when you give the khabar, okay, when you give the main uh, piece of information about that noun, you have to follow it in its gender. So if I said, for example, this mar'a, this woman, she is tall, do I say tawil or tawila? Tawila. So why, I always thought this came to my mind, why did Allah say, inna rahmatallahi qareebun? And why didn't he say, inna rahmatallahi qareebatun? Min al Muhsinin. Ibn al Qayyim, he said, in a beautiful way, and I can't really um, say it the way he said it, but he said, it is as if Allah is saying, Inna Allah bi rahmatihi qareebun min al Muhsinin. Subhanallah. Inna Allah bi rahmatihi qareebun min al Muhsinin. It is Allah with his mercy that is close to the believers. So, Inna Allah, which is a masculine noun, it is with his mercy that he is close to the believers. Meaning, Allah is saying, is trying to say in this most amazing way, really, yani this is some rich balagha, like eloquence in this verse, which I don't think in English you can truly understand and appreciate. But it's as if Allah has stripped that ta, that ta marbuta, that feminineness from this word, to really indicate how the mercy of Allah is so close to the, to the believers. Okay, and those who know a bit of Arabic, just try and reflect over this verse. Ibn Qayyim, he spoke about this in his beautiful book, Tariq al-Hijratayn. And towards the beginning of this book, Tariq al-Hijratayn, he speaks about this in a, in a most eloquent and beautiful manner. Okay. Um, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لو يعلم المؤمن ما عند الله من العقوبة ما طمع بجنته أحد ولو يعلم الكافر ما عند الله من الرحمة ما قنت من جنته أحد رواه مسلم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم said if a believer knew what Allah had in terms of punishment if a believer if we if a believer truly understood the nature of the عذاب the nature of the punishment that is in store for the people in the hereafter, there would be no person who would desire Jannah. Because he would realize yeah, the, the, the way to enter into the hellfire is that easy. It is that easy to enter into the hellfire. So no one, if a person really understood how you can easily fall into hellfire, no one would have hopes of entering into Jannah. And then he said, وَلَوْ يَعْلَمُ الْكَافِرِ That if a kafir knew the, the extent of Allah's mercy, he would never despair. No one would despair. Not even the kafir would despair of Allah's Jannah. If he really knew. If he really knew the extent of Allah's mercy. Now the difference between um, um, Rahman and, uh, and Rahim. Rahman is, we say it's a more generic type of mercy. It's more general. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is Rahman to the believers and the, and the disbelievers. He is merciful to the believers as well as the disbelievers. So his, that, this is really the most merciful. And this is why it is, is haram, absolutely haram for someone to be called Rahman. It's haram for someone to be called Rahman. It's not allowed. No one can share that, call, that name. Where someone could be Alim, someone could even be Rahim. Even Allah described the Prophet ﷺ as being Rahim, merciful. But Rahman is only for Allah. Because no one can show this mercy to anyone. No one can show this similar amount of mercy to creation like Allah. We can be merciful towards um, you know, our family. We can be merciful towards uh, you know, our neighbors, etc., but how many of us would truly be merciful even towards our enemies? To those who we really dislike. Whereas Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful to, uh, to them. 
even to his en- even to his enemies, because he gives them chance. He provides for them. He sustains them. But Allah subhanahu wa taala has decreed for His infinite wisdom that the believers be ashidda, that they will be strong and severe and harsh against the disbelievers. Ruhama'u baynahum, but they are merciful to one another, because the human being is not capable. If he's, if he's a true believer, he's not capable of showing mercy towards someone who, you know, is an enemy of Allah subhanahu wa taala. This is why the Christian belief of you know turning your other cheek. It's a belief that goes against natural disposition. It goes against fitrah. It goes against fitrah. When they say love your enemy, you're telling yourself to go against your own fitrah. It's very easy to say that as well. But believe me, if someone comes and murders your parents, you know, show me a human being that will truly be merciful towards him. Anyhow, the, so this is a rahmah which is, encompasses everyone, including the disbelievers. Allah, He gives them chances to repent. Allah sends them prophets and scriptures. Whereas Allah is rahim towards the believers, meaning this is a more specific type of mercy, where He is merciful only towards the believers. So this is a higher level of mercy. A higher level of mercy. And this is a type of mercy which encompasses... Um, where Allah, He takes care of the affairs of the believers internally in terms of looking after the state of their heart, nurturing their iman, giving them tawfiq, this divine assistance to do good deeds, etc. Now, this is a wisdom, I believe, and Allah knows best, why Rahim has been mentioned more than Rahman in the Quran. We said, remember, Rahim is mentioned 114 times. Double to Rahman. Why? Because this Rahmah, Allah is Rahim, more specifically towards the believers, it's a higher level of, rah- of Rahmah. And because Allah's mercy is so infinite, that will naturally mean this higher level of mercy is actually implemented more by Allah than the generic form of mercy. The generic form of mercy. Some other scholars say Rahman is the one who possesses the mercy and Rahim is the one who bestows that mercy. That's another interpretation. But I, I prefer the, f- the first interpretation, which is that Rahman is the one who is merciful to everyone, even the disbelievers, and whereas he's Rahim only to the, uh, to the believers. Now, just a few points before we end, inshallah. Um, the effects of knowing that Allah is Rahman and Rahim. If you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman and Rahim, and this is very important because you must ponder and reflect over this. You know, we believe that Allah is Rahman and Rahim, but yani, what effect should it have on us? Firstly, it necessitates our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Necessitates our love for Him. Why? Because when someone shows you so much mercy, you can do nothing except love that person. And this is why our love for our parents is so intrinsically a part of our nature because of the amount of love they have shown to you. The amount of love they have shown to you so much and this is why you love them sincerely. This is why you love them sincerely. Secondly, it instills in a believer a sense of fear from disobeying his commandment. Because when someone has showered you with his favours, it becomes very difficult to go against what they have said. You know, imagine there are two people, for example, one person has never given, he, never given you anything in his life, he's never um, uh, shown any acts of generosity towards you, and then he asks you to do something. He asks you to do something. It will be very easy for you to say no to him, isn't it? You say, no, sorry, I can't do this for you, you know, and, and you'll make up an excuse Okay. Whereas if someone who is a close friend to you always is there for you, always when you're in difficulty, you know he's that friend is there for you, and they shower, you know they give you favors. If you're in need of money, they lend you money. If you need physical assistance, they give you physical assistance. If they one day come and ask you to do something for you, how will you respond? You're going to find it very difficult to not respond to that uh, to that call for help, isn't it? So just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He commands us, we feel a sense of haya, a sense of shame. How can we disobey Allah after all that He has given us? Thirdly, 
if you know that Allah is merciful to you, then this naturally makes a believer want to be more merciful to, to others. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. أَلَا تُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ Don't they wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, the ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um, um, uh, the ayah what is the ayah The meaning of the verse is that pardon and uh, um, and forgive others. Pardon and forgive others. And he show acts of mercy to others. Do you not wish that Allah to, to forgive you? Meaning, if you want Allah to show mercy to, towards you, you need to show mercy towards others. That's why Rasulullah said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَرْحَمُ عِبَادَهُ الرحماء. Allah is merciful towards His merciful slaves. Allah is merciful towards His merciful slaves. The other effect that it has on the, the believers, uh, and also a very important hadith, Rasulullah says, مَن لَا يَرْحَمْ مَن لَا يَرْحَمُ النَّاسِ لَا يَرْحَمُهُ اللَّهِ The one who shows no mercy to mankind, Allah will show no mercy to him. The one who shows no mercy to mankind, Allah shows no mercy to him. As found in uh, Bukhari and Muslim. Fifthly, um, or sorry, fourthly, if you truly realize the extent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, a person will strive to know what Allah loves and what Allah hates. If you realize the extent of Allah's mercy for you, you will naturally feel very inclined towards knowing what does Allah love and what does Allah hate. What does Allah love and what does Allah hate. So therefore, to give you an example, when you know, someone who is very close to you and has shown you a lot of care and affection comes to your house to eat, okay, what are you going to cook for them? Something that... They like. Okay? And if you don't know what they like, what will you ask them? What would you like to eat? Okay? And you'll be careful not to give them something that they dislike to eat. So, why? Because this is a natural feeling. When someone shows you this act, you know, kinds of generosity, acts of generosity towards you, you want to respond by doing something that they will love. Okay? And that's why the believer, he strives to learn the halal and the haram. This is the way he views halal and haram. See, many people, how do they view halal and haram? They view it as a strict code of law. If I don't do it, I will end up in the hellfire. And if I do it, I end up in Jannah. This is the way they view halal and haram only. A simple code like that. Haram, just to avoid... No, we learn halal and haram to learn what, what does Allah love? What does Allah love? So when you learn the fiqh of salah, for example, you essentially, you have this desire to worship Allah in a way that He loves. To worship Allah in a way that He loves. When you learn what is haram, you're being careful not to fall into those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates. This is a very high level. Fifthly, when you realize the extent of Allah's mercy, you realize that you have these feelings where you can never repay back Allah. You can never fulfill the rights of Allah. So the believer is always in a, is in a state of regret. He is always, no matter how much ibadah he performs, he always realizes that this act of ibadah will never match the generosity that Allah has given me, or this mercy that He has shown to me. That's why if you look at the Salaf, they were never people who يعني, would feel proud of their acts of ibadah. They would always feel as though they were muqassirin. They were people who were, um, uh, uh, people who were, you know, who fell short in their ibadah. And that's not because of the nature of their ibadah, but because they realized the greatness of Allah 
and the amount of mercy he bestowed upon them. This is a very important point. I want you to reflect on this. Again, the Salaf. When they belittled their ibadah, it wasn't for the ibadah itself. It was because they could not match this ibadah with the kindness and the generosity of Allah. Otherwise, subhanAllah, their ibadah was great. The ibadah was great, the khushu' that they had in their salah, the amount of zakat they would give, charity they would give, everything that they would strive, was truly great. And if that was us, you know, we would be over the moon with their ibadah they had. But they realized this could never match how Allah truly deserves to be worshipped. And finally, and this is the final point we will conclude with, inshallah, when a person truly realizes the greatness of his mercy, then he will never despair from his mercy. He will never despair from his mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الْثُنُوبَ جَمِيعًا O oh, my servants, say, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي Say, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا قُلْ يَا قُلْ يَا عِبَادِي so say to my believing slaves, that my believing slaves, those who have wronged themselves, those who have wronged themselves, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah. Because Allah forgives all sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all sins. And inshallah we will conclude with that. And that's our final conclusion on the basmala, on the statement of Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And inshallah ta'ala, next week we will begin from Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Aqooli qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Subhanakallah wa hamdika shadwa la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaha.